Hey, Renee. Hi, Declan. It's good to be back home. Yeah, we've just been at the USAMS meeting, yeah, which is our yeah. annual scientific meeting down in Adelaide. That was good fun. It was really fun. A fun-filled, hard-working four days, uh, but it was it was great. Well done to uh, conveners Michael Cheung and Dixon Woon. Dixon Woon, Woon yep. And, and uh, all eyes on Perth 2025 yeah. to Shane LaBianca and uh, Trent Barrett. So if you haven't been to uh, the USANS annual scientific meeting, it's a great meeting. It's a kind of medium-sized meeting, a thousand odd people, but I think we have 14 or 15 international faculty. It yeah. is a really enjoyable meeting. It is, and I think and one of the highlights is the, the, the selection of international faculty. And, you know, over the four days, you really get to spend a lot of time with them, get to know them quite well. And in fact, you get a little bit of withdrawal when you, when you leave the meeting. So it's wonderful when one of them follows us back home. As they did this time, as it <laughs> turns out. Yes, Professor Neil Fleshner is here with us Hello. in the flesh in our GUCAR studio, Professor of Urology from Toronto. Neil, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here in your uh, you're fine no city and your fine yeah. country. So it's great <laughs> but you're no here. stranger to Australia, right? I am not. I've no. been at about five times or so. Wow. so that's great. Believe... But it is so great to have you here. And uh, and you were uh, you were such a highlight at the meeting for, oh, for several kind. reasons. That's but, kind. Uh, yeah, this is going to be great. Good. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Let's have some fun. So this is one of our uh, themed podcasts. Podcasts, as regular listeners and viewers will know, um, GU Cast is supported by a partnership program. We have some superb partners from across the GU oncology industry, pharmaceutical companies, device companies, who help us uh, put on this for free, so we can bring it for free to you all. Um, and this week, one of our bronze partners, uh, Cipla Pharmaceuticals, here in Australia, they're actually a big global company mm. uh, out of India. But Cipla support um, a lot of GU oncology here, and their main product is uh, Firmagon. So they're supporting this product because we've got two things we want to talk about today. The first of which is, yeah, ADT, ADT, and uh, how do we select patients? How do we make sure that the, uh, the ADT that we're prescribing is safe for patients? So we want to talk about cardiovascular risks, etc. But the second bit of the podcast, and please stick around for it, is nothing to do with geo-oncology, really, per se. We want to talk to Dr. Fleschner about innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, in general. Very exciting. Yeah, because uh, he has some really, really, really great stories to tell about Personal that, so. insights, which yeah, we're looking so forward to hearing. Please stick around uh, uh, for that. So, And thanks to our friends at CIPLA for partnering with us on this. We are an independent clinician-led podcast, so they don't uh, pre-approve any of this, but um, because we have these joint areas of interest in geo-oncology, they're very happy to partner with us. But um, yeah, Renu, so first of all, we want to chat about um, ADT and cardiovascular. Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an important thing to discuss because, you know, we, we've come a long way in prostate cancer research and now we've got great evidence supporting duplet therapy triplet therapy you know lutetium psma but the underlying common denominator for all of these treatments is still ADT. adt exactly so out there all the time here in australia around the world many of you listeners and viewers are having men come into your clinic whether they're newly diagnosed metastatic or we've treated them before but now they've got metastases and yeah we reach for most often a prescription for ADT, uh, in many of the regions we speak to, it can be surgery. Uh, but especially for the patients who are being prescribed ADT, LHRH analogs or GNRH antagonists uh, are in our armamentarium. And one way or the other, I think, Neil, something that we as urologists and radiation oncologists don't always appreciate is the fact that these drugs have predictable cardiovascular side effects. And maybe, first of all, we don't always understand the, the baseline risk right. for patients. So we wanted to ask you, first of all, about that. You know, yeah. we're always very liberal. You've got this positive scan. Your PSA is 100. Let's take a script out and, and get you going on some ADT. We're going to get that PSA under control. We're going to get your symptoms under control. But do we, do we really dig in and, and, and understand no. the patient? No, I mean, it's a great question. We don't dig in enough. And I think when you recognize that men need ADT, let's face it, they need it for the, their cancers. They need it for their prostate cancer. But aside from, you know, the men who need ADT are aging men. And aging men have other comorbidities, yeah. particularly cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the ADT doesn't only increase the risk of the cardiovascular, but also increases the metabolic syndrome, which then increases the risk yeah. of the cardiovascular. So we need, I think, when you prescribe a drug, you have an obligation to really look at what you're doing, what are the side effects, and in my view, be either prepared to interact and mitigate them or at least refer on to somebody who can and i think cardiovascular risk there's no doubt is inherent in giving adt aging men need testosterone and we take it away it's not a great thing so we need to be aware of risk factors pre-existing risk factors obviously the classic ones hypertension cholesterol diabetes pre-diabetes sedentary life smoking 
But we also, and, and we need to take that into account. And I think now the evidence suggests that, you know, if we, if we do that, we could actually minimize the adverse effects of it. So I think that's really important. So it's not just a fait accompli. It's something that we can do. Something but about. it seems hard, Neil, you know, for a urologist to, you mm. know, when you're in a busy practice and you've got 20 patients in clinic and you've got someone on ADT, what are the pertinent questions to ask? What, how do you assess for their cardiovascular right. risk? Well, a couple of things, you know, I think it's really important to recognize as a clinician, if you prescribe a drug and Mr. Smith doesn't show up three months later <laughs> because, and then you find out he's had a stent put in. You, usually, you don't make a connection That's between right. the yeah, prescription yeah. An and guy, that yeah. event. And, and similarly, um, because they're ultimately not that common. And secondly, if somebody doesn't show up, you usually don't know why they didn't show up. Yeah. Or if somebody says, you know, I had a, a stent put in it's two weeks ago, you'll say, you don't make the connection. So you, you can't recognize side effects that are uncommon mm. to your treatment in your practice because it tends to be a small part of it. Yeah, a numerator denominator thing. So, so first of all, so so the, all you could do is be pre- proactive, in my yeah. view. So you need to say, okay, it's very simple, a basic screen, right? Just ask for a history of of heart disease, ask for a history of aortic disease, ask for a history of diabetes. I mean, this is all basic med school one hundred and one stuff. Yeah. We all yeah. know risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and and I think. To suggest that urologists can't do it is an insult to our field. We're all pretty smart people. Everyone's done well in school. And this is basic GP work. Mm -hmm. So to say that we can't do it is, in my view, insulting. We can do it, and it's an obligation to do it. So I think it is important. And are there any situations in which you think uh, that someone's risk factors are too great to preclude ADT at all? Have you had that situation, and how do you do it? No, I've never... I, I mean... There's no doubt there may be patients, you know, there are many patients when you can anticipate they're going to need ADT in mm-hmm. the future. The, the obvious one is a patient who's got a PSA recurrence after surgery and or radiation and the PSA is slowly creeping up. And you're saying like, Mr. Jones, in the next year, two, three, you may need ADT. And that's a great opportunity to do what I call prehab. Absolutely. Right? Like lose some weight because it's going to be really hard to do it when you're on the drugs. Uh, but in addition to that, if a man needs ADT, if they've got cord compression, if they have pain, they need the drug. It's mm-hmm. simple. There's no other treatment for prostate cancer that is nearly equally efficacious than just good old-fashioned LHRH therapy or castration. So we're stuck with it. And I think all we can do is try our best in those cases to give the drug and simultaneously pull in either manage it ourselves or pull in the people who need it, um, uh, who can help us and help the patient. So that's clearly one aspect is optimizing your patient who's come in, he's got this diagnosis of prostate cancer, mm-hmm. but let's, you know, as caring physicians figure out what else is going on with this patient. And I remember Peter Alberson's systematic review from many right. years ago showed that it's about like 30, 35% of patients yes. who have one of these underlying risk factors, Correct. some of them greater than others, but like it is a very, very common thing. So having approached the patient related factors, see have we optimized that? Have they seen their primary care physician or their cardiologist? Now, when it comes down to the ADT then, this has been an interesting story over the right. past 10 years, is what about uh, the risk with LHRH analogs compared to GNRH antagonists like right. Degarelics? Because you know, one of the, there are a few benefits from that therapy. One of the putative ones uh, in the early days was there may be less like plaque disruption or other Related things that might FSH. be triggered. Yeah. So what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? So, so it's a controversial and remains a controversial yeah. topic in our field. There's no doubt that... Um, that it, you know, cardiovascular risk is up in those patients. That the Albertson analysis you referred to was a sort of a secondary analysis, a pooled analysis from randomized trials, sort of aggregated. Um, and I think I think what it showed was those, particularly with pre, as you mentioned, with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, seem to do better with a uh, antagonist and an agonist. And I think there was also somewhat reinforced in the Hero trial, right, where an oral antagonist yeah. did have lower uh, amounts particularly of grade one and two major cardiac events. There was, of course, however, and, and credit to um, the folks who make Firmagon, Faring, they actually did a trial, the pronounced trial, trial, and it was a large randomized trial, very rarely done in medicine and by pharma companies, which was sort of a trial to look at the outcomes. And, and, and that trial was largely negative. I think we have to be clear. Uh, it, was, it couldn't accrue patients arguably underpowered, but largely disappointing. 
However, in that trial, as you can imagine, given the way ethics boards work, is the patient had to get their risk factors modified. So in addition to being put on an agonist or an antagonist, you also had your cholesterol de mm. dealt with. You also had your hypertension dealt with. So I think, I think the message is, I think the best evidence today would suggest that if you're well managed medically, it probably doesn't matter. But the reality is most men aren't. <laughs> so, so, so given there's a lot of chaos in our worlds and men are generally hopeless at this, I think the evidence would suggest that if you're not being adequately managed, it probably certainly wouldn't hurt and may help to use an antagonist as opposed to an agonist. And I, that's the way I summarize the existing literature on this. Yeah, good points, isn't it? Yeah, I totally agree. And um, uh, so I, therefore, I think the message for the audience out there is number one, assess your patient very carefully. That's the, the most the, important. It, it is the most important. Thing, that's the most because you are aggravating their cardiac risk. Let, okay. Let's face it, right? So, you know, um, and in my particular practice, I'm very passionate about this. Like I prescribe, every, we measure every year in our clinic a lipid profile. We check a blood pressure every so often. We measure hemoglobin A1C. And I actually, maybe uniquely, measure, manage that myself. I'll prescribe metformin. I'll prescribe Crestor. Mm. I'll prescribe an ARB if I need to. Now, that may be a little too far for most urologists, but I, for me, it's a personal thing, and I, I, I like to do it. But I think, you know, many urologists don't have that, that gumption or time. Most of my, the work I'm doing is done by a physician assistant, frankly, not me. It's under my guidance. So if you're busy and working, you might not have time, but at least align with somebody who can help you, whether it's a cardio-oncologist, and there is a, a, a burgeoning field in cardio-oncology, or if not, a fantastic primary care doctor. But if they can't, like most men are useless, we're terrible. I'm speaking now, Declan, like you and me, like we don't really look after ourselves as good as we should. And that's probably like most of our patients. So it wouldn't hurt to use an, an antagonist, I think, because that pronounced trial didn't really finish. But Declan, that's a good point, isn't it? I mean, we talk a lot about the importance of multidisciplinary care in prostate cancer. And, and what, what are your thoughts on the Im embedding of a cardiologist into the into the prostate cancer world. But look, I mean, for most of the time, getting access to a cardiologist in many health systems, our systems here in Australia included, yeah. is like a pipe dream. These, these folk are busy doing their own stuff. But uh -huh. actually, just as Neil hinted at, um, because of this new field of cardio-oncology, it's not so much for our ADT patients, it's because so many of these new, powerful, amazing drugs we have, like checkpoint inhibitors, Absolutely. do have a lot of uh, cardiotoxicity. Yeah. Yeah. So and by it, the way, yeah. as we further suppress the androgen axis with the ARPIs, mm -hmm. yes. there's even a, a greater burden. If you actually look at the cardiac um, effects in some of the M0, for example, CRPC trials, the Spartan, Prosper, Aracens trials, you will see, if you look carefully in the AE chart, that there's a higher risk of cardiac events in those who are, again, have their androgen axis furtherly <laughs> suppressed. Yeah. So now that men, you know, when you think about things like Embark, or, or now we may enter this era where men on, on ARPIs for five, 10 years could happen, I think it's almost gonna become more important. <laughs> so, so, so I think, the importance of this topic is only going to grow. It's yeah, not going to actually go away. Yeah. And, and we do, therefore, have better access, actually, than we used to. Um, but I think a lot of it is still primary care, and I, I, I don't prescribe uh, statins like you do, and I, I suspect many of the younger it's listeners... It's very easy. Viewers. But yeah... C-R-E-S-T-O-R. -E -E <laughs> by the way, do you check the LFTs like a few I months do. ago and stuff? You're, yeah, he's a proper old doctor. I, I, he's I, I, he's I, a do. proper I, it's not I want Dr. Fletcher to, to look after <laughs> me when I'm older. But <laughs> hang on, if you're on Aberaterone, you're checking the LFTs anyway, yeah. so it's like on our sheet. Yeah, it's yeah, not that hard yeah. to do. Um, and the other field that have boomed in the cancer center since is gastroenterologists as well because exactly. of, again all the yeah. enteric complications of exactly. checkpoint inhibitors exactly. but before we finish on on this topic um uh, i mean traditionally the reason that we a lot of us have used the antagonist is that classic patient who comes in the door with painful sure. bone metastasis yeah. psa a thousand there terrible back pain and you know and they're the ones you used to take to the or to do an orchidectomy on in the old yes. days and and across asia pacific of course that's still a main tool for adt um but i think what i used to do in the early days was i used to sort of use dagger relics for that reason i'd say always but there aren't that many of those patients but it was so enjoyable and i remember yeah. one of the first times i prescribed that drug 
getting a phone call a few hours later from the patient's daughter because she'd had my, my mobile number. And I thought, oh, bugger, what's happened to Uh-oh. this this nice man? I just wanted to ring you to say his pain has gone away. <laughs> he's like, he's crazy. That, this is like 7 o'clock in the evening. So we still have that, but it's I suppose it's over the last 10 years I've begun to reflect a lot more on the cardiovascular risk thing. So now I use that drug a lot more for You know, I think we didn't care about that question, this. Actually. Yeah, like we didn't care about this 20 years ago because the patients lived like two, three years. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, right. Now, although the evidence is many of the cardiac events occur in the first year, funnily enough, but that aside, men now are going to be living five, 10 years yeah. uh, on even with metastatic disease. We're now at the sort of, right, the 60 month rate. And it's only going to get better. Mm-hmm. And longer, so we have to pay more attention to what we're doing. That's why I think you're right about the AR pathway inhibitors, because traditionally the reason why asking the question about the uh, uh, the baseline risk is important is because they're the ones that get the event within a year because they have underlying plaque formation, etc., etc. Of course, you know ADT doesn't like directly cause people who are very well with no cardiovascular. They don't get an event within a year. Correct. It's the ones with even if the event was well controlled, they had a stent two years ago. Yeah. They're the ones that get an event within a year. But you're right, because they're not all dying within two or three years now, they're on AR pathway inhibitors, there's a secondary risk right. about being a, on this whole ADT, exactly. older patient, AR pathway inhibitor. It's sort of a cancer survivorship issue, yeah. isn't it? And, it, you know, and even if it's not ADT that we're focusing on, even if it's, you know, something as simple as exercise physiology, which now has become, a, you know, a huge focus in, yeah. in managing metastatic prostate cancer, you really do have to assess their cardiovascular risk, even if it is right. exercise that you're prescribing. Right. So should we go on and talk about the other thing? Oh, exciting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, Neil was down in Australia this week and... You had a few great lectures on different aspects of oncology, but you did a great talk at the end of the conference on uh, sure. innovation and entrepreneurship. And just by way of a little bit of background, um, well, th- I think you've set up two interesting companies over recent years, but right. one of them we've had an interest in, uh, Point Biopharma, uh, because of our interest in radioligand therapy, as regular uh, viewers and listeners will know about. And Point Biopharma was set up by Neil and Co. Um, four or five years ago to develop a novel radioligand therapy and develop clinical trials the splash trial, which is is, is coming to maturity, um, and his company has become very successful. Mm-hmm. It's floated on the stock exchange. It's been acquired recently by Eli Lilly, so it's a very profitable business. And the other company, I think, was in BCG, et cetera, et yep, cetera. Exactly. So what we want to pick your brains on is to tell us a little bit about the story of your journey right. uh, towards developing com- successful companies. Right. And tips, I suppose, and tricks for, for listeners and viewers out there. I, I don't know that there's any tips except maybe I can motivate people to say that I think anybody can do this. So, you know, I, I think both of these companies were born out of frustration with our system. The first um, was born out of, and just to be clear, I've been an academic professorial, right? Still writing grants, big That's research, people, like I still do that. And I'm a kind of a nerdy geek that way. But I was, I don't like no for an answer, I think. And I think a lot of surgeons are like that, frankly. And it all started probably about six or seven years ago when we had a BCG shortage in Canada. Uh, Merck and Sanofi were both making the drugs. Uh, Sanofi had a problem in their plant, which actually was made in Toronto, half hour from our hospital. And they basically closed down their whole BCG um, franchise. And that left us with one supplier. And then... That supplier could not ramp up their supply for Canada and the U.S., frankly. And the question, and then it got bizarre. You know, how do you ration a drug, particularly we're in the first world, we're in Canada. We have a drug that if you have carcinoma in sight to, cures like 70% of patients. And and if it doesn't work, you kind of lose your bladder, at least back then. So I thought this was horrible. And we started rationing the drug. We were giving like a tenth of the dose, you know, to people or a third of the dose. And, and you know, there was some evidence justifying. But at the end of the day, I really got a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. And uh, I ran into um, an old friend um, who was in the business and we talked. And we actually formed a company to basically import BCG to Canada. And now we, and that, that, that was the fodder for the company. And now we, ha- we own about half of the market share in Canada. <laughs> and we've now expanded to Puerto Rico and the U.S. And, and it's like a real thing. There's about 70 employees. And, um, and it's kind of fun. And it's an alternative to what we do. Around the same time, I, as being an avant-garde practitioner, you think writing Crestor is, is, is avant-garde. <laughs> I, um, um, 
got interested in some of these crazy case reports coming out of Germany with Lutetia and PSMA. And, you know, there's these case reports, I'm sure you've all seen it, these case reports in, in the nuclear medicine journals of men looking like Dalmatian dogs on, on, on PSMA yeah. scans and they get treated and, and most and their disease melts away. And I had a few wealthy and uh, well-to-do patients who basically had no treatment options. And I said, listen, if you wish, I'll take you to Germany. I'll be your fit personal physician for a week. Let's go. We'll get you treated. So I took escorted two patients. This was in January 2019 to Berlin, and we got them treated. And even though I was their physician, I was doing nothing. I was just hanging out. We were having dinners and glasses of wine. But the reality was, I during the day they were doing it as an inpatient as well. But um, so once they got started, I took all that time and just started learning from on the back end. How do you make it? How does this work? What's the scan? It was totally new to me. You know, we're not really trained in nuclear medicine. You guys are way ahead of us. And I came back home and I said, I went to the head of the cancer center. I said, we need to start a lutetium program here. I've got a donor. Let's get it going. One of the gentlemen gave me a few million dollars. And, and I got, kept getting the roadblocks. And I've started big programs in our hospital. And I was getting things. What were they saying? They were saying, it's t- this is too early. Uh, they had a fledgling lutetium dotatate uh, program. They said, let's wait for the results of that. Uh, urology shouldn't be doing this. It should be nuclear med or radiation oncology or med onc. I didn't like that one. Um, so, so I, I kept getting the gears and, and it started to frustrate me. So again, it's, that's the common theme. But as part of this journey, I said to myself, well, how am I actually going to get this drug to patients? Because you can't make take the pills off the shelf. They're, they have half-lives, they decay. Okay. So I started looking around. I said, who in this neighborhood of my city is going to be able to make and distribute this? And it turned out that literally like 40 minutes down the road in Hamilton, Ontario, there was an incubated company, a non-for-profit, that was like a world expert in contract manufacturing of both pet um, tracers, but also therapeutic isotopes and they were shipping them around the world so even though canadian patients weren't benefiting from that there was the expertise in my backyard so i took their ceo with he and i went out for dinner one night they had a couple of bottles of wine talked about life and i said you know we, we just kind of gelled and then a couple of, about a week later we had a board meeting for the company number one i just told you about and i said at the end of the board meeting, to sort of any other business, I said, guys, I just got back from Germany. I've been talking. I gave a little presentation to my board of directors. And everybody said, this is interesting. And basically, we decided to spin Point off as a subsidiary of the company one. And, uh, and then eventually, we just went out our own. So Joe McCann, who was the CEO of that startup incubator company, the non-for-profit, became our CEO. And... We raised money. We actually we went to Germany, bought some molecules uh, from great scientists, and then we uh, away we went. Raised some money, got into trials, bought a bought a building in Indianapolis. Started started. We developed the most sophisticated plant in the world for radio pharmaceutical assembly, and A to B to C. We ended up with and and then here you go. We just got taken over as a platform company by Eli Lilly who wanted to like it's a growing field and you needed to have a footprint in that space so that that's the story anybody can do this I'm telling you he keeps saying anybody can do this no but I I, it's born out of frustration curiosity and um, just a can do mentality I think if you're a point if your institution is making you do I call it the shoulder shrug sign some some people, I, to me, it means some people have kind of given up the oomph for the like the reason we're here. We're here to innovate and make um, people's lives better. That's what I think a healer physician should do. So, you know, I, I don't like no. I love trying to figure out a solution that work that works around the no. But it seems to me, Neil, the the number one challenge is coming up with that idea, that novel idea, that area of need right, that no one else has thought of. You had this big BCG shortage in Canada. No one else thought of importing BCG. Because other people will take no for an answer. Right. It's as simple as that. They didn't go through the hurdles. Right, like, because I think some people say, like, okay, this is what it is. I'll give my patients a tenth of the dose or a third of the dose. 
I, I, I just wasn't happy for that. I, th I think at the, at the heart of it is entrepreneurship is solving a problem. Because the only thing that has value is something that frustrates or you, know, you make life better in some little way for, for the human condition. That's the essence of entrepreneurship. And, and I think as you're all just, we're naturally curious. We naturally innovate. You know, all the robot, remember the robot was originally what? For heart, I think, surgery was developed. And it was taken over by urology because we're incredibly creative. So I, I, I honestly feel that any urologist, we're particularly good. We're also very independent-minded, and I think that's a great, you know, the rad onks and the med onks are more, frankly, more um, sort of um, the analogy, like we're like herding pigs or herding cats, and they're like, you know, like, like, like horses. And, it's a, and we need them all, but I think we have a, a different mindset. Right. It's amazing. And for people out there listening, and Renu just asked the question, how, how do you come up with the idea? But if you listen very carefully to what he said, these two great ideas, and by the way, the second one led to a $1.4 billion acquisition of Point uh, by Lilly. So this is like not small time, it's big time. Yeah. Both of them came out of frustration in a clinical urology environment. So ask yourself this question as you're out there, finish a day's work in Europe or uh, Asia, Africa, South, wherever you are, was there something that frustrated you at work today and that frustrates you all the time? And you, you know, keep taking no for an answer. It's a BCG shortage. You're not the only one. So you're not yeah. the only one. <laughs> and um, so I, I love the simplicity of your message. Yeah. And that, of course, it's very modest uh, to say that. But there's something in that that, you know, smart people, the smart people listen and watch these podcasts. What are the frustrations you have at work, like Neil Fleischner had? And then, you know, have a think about how can I fix this? You know, you're smart people. And okay, it, 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 maybe it'll help that there's a donor that'll help with this or that. But there are also people out there who want ideas from frustrated clinicians and nurses and, and so on. There's Isn't that a true whole world of capital, access to capital. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of um, grants and a lot of governments want to stimulate entrepreneurs. I mean, my story would have been a, a death knell for my academic career 15, 20 years ago. Now, Ironically, I'm asked to speak about it <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so weird. You know, I gave I gave a keynote speak speech on medical entrepreneurship to the USC School of Management, the Anderson School, about a year ago. So it's so funny how new uh, timing never hurts, but new opportunities have also been afforded to me, which I think is great. Neil, you're I mean, you're so well connected. But what is your advice to those who maybe have a great idea but don't know where to start? What 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 are their you know steps one, two, and three? Well, I think step one is don't tell the whole world about it. Okay. Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> so be very selective in who, yeah. who and, and then secondly, um, try and find a, a co-conspirator. Okay. I got, I, I use that term obviously a little bit tongue in cheek, but a, somebody who can work on this with you mm -hmm. and, and we're all busy clinicians. I think if uh, one of my red flags is if the owner, inventor, idea generator is also the CEO because yeah. we're all so busy then you can't do this part-time and you've really you know entrepreneurship's about risk you have to put your money in you have to put your time in and you have to make it a focus of your life or you better hire somebody to do that do I couldn't yeah. do that but I was yeah. fortunate enough to have the right people around me who could yeah. and wanted to do that so so uh, there is access to capital out there um, but usually it starts with a friends and family idea. I mean, I hate to say it, but your seed money is generally friends and family. Can we ask you finally what, what next uh, for, for you? Personally, you're on a bit of a sabbatical, I think, at the moment. Yes. But actually, listening to your, all your other lectures this week, you're still so actively involved yes. in neoadjuvant studies for high-risk yeah. prostate cancer. You had another amazing talk on uh, diversity in prostate cancer in Canada, right. different subpopulations. It looks like your passion for those things aren't changing, but give, give us a little idea about what's I, ahead next. You week. know what? I'm taking life sort of a few months at a time. I still love my academic work. I have a very large and productive research group. And, and frankly, um, I could have gone to work full time in industry. And I just don't think that's for me. Um, so I want I, I want to go back and I want to keep publishing. And who knows, maybe one day another idea will pop up that'll end up a company. But right now, I'm just really focusing on enjoying the moment because this is out. It's been a fun ride. Um, 
particularly with a sabbatical sort of tied in perfect timing. And then in the fall, um, when I go back to work as a clinician, like a lot of my patients miss me. You know, I still get a lot of emails and it's hard not to, uh, to answer them. Yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure that. having you, Neil. And uh, uh, I mean, you, you continue to me. inspire so many of us. So, I mean, not not just not just with all of this, but you've been a you've been a role model for so many of our yeah you know young consultants who've been fellows with you in right. Toronto and uh, and continue. And actually, to do when you well. think about it, um, a couple of his um, people who've done clinical fellowships with yeah. you have yeah. had a bit of an entrepreneurial streak, like Joseph. Joseph, Joseph. Yes. yeah. Well, yeah. he was in Vancouver. Yeah, oh, he's right. in Vancouver. That's right. But, but, I, but he's doing a great Canadian job. Dream. And I Nathan uh, definitely has. Nathan, Nathan definitely sure. has. Yeah. He's a guy who gets frustrated at work I can tell you for <laughs> yeah. people who work he, with him he's got, he's got the same DNA for yeah, sure for he sure, has and yeah. he's come up with some good ideas and he's, he's got one thing he's commercialising I think that yeah. Yeah. and uh, so yeah go and do a fellowship in GU Oncology and Entrepreneurship in Toronto I might do it myself might apply yeah, myself we might come apply on myself. anyone okay. wants to yeah. come I, I, but it actually raises good questions maybe we should develop a fellow. you actually Absolutely. just gave me a great idea yeah. it's yours <laughs> but maybe we should develop you know sort of a fellowship where you can actually you know join a startup and spend some time you know because there's there's quite a bit of focus on this in say the prostate cancer foundation retreat mm -hmm. you know there's always a talk on you know how to not just how to interact with pharma but how to how to how to do a startup you know how to start it from scratch but we don't really have that focus in australia so that's why it's been great to have you out here speaking yeah, but I, i've been impressed with some of the things i saw at the meeting mm -hmm. I, i've met uh, quite a few people who are were, were were sort of surgeon entrepreneurs so I think it's a probably, frankly, better than Canada what, from what I've seen. There you go, listeners. Don't lose hope. Have hope. I, I love the simple message. Anyone can do it. It's born out of clinical conundrum. So as you hang up this podcast, a have a think. scientist entrepreneur. What has frustrated you at work this week? And then yeah. don't just put up with it or whinge about it. Do Find something a solution. About it. Exactly. Fix it. That's all we have time for on this episode of GUcast. Thanks again to our friends at CIPLA for bringing Neil out this week and for um, having us talk about cardiovascular disease. We look forward uh, to dinner with you, Neil. We certainly do. All right. And a glass of wine. Take care. Thank you very much.